The chance of a lifetime for Luis Gonzalez. 2 2, bottom of the ninth. Game seven of the World Series. Bases loaded. On any day of the week, at any hour of the day, New York City is in motion. A heart beating to a perpetual rhythm. No one, least of all the eight million people who give the city life, think that it could all change in an instant. But when you least expect it, when all you can think about are catching trains and racing to the office, it can suddenly stop. And when it does, what we hold on to are the little things, those moments that once seemed so ordinary. My dad drove me to work maybe about a week before September 11th um, in his fire chief's car, just me and him. My dad was Chief Gerard, or Jerry, Barbara, New York City Fire Department, the best dad a girl could have. And one of the many things he gave me uh, was a love for the Yankees, because he grew up with that. We always sort of incorporated the Yankees in our summer. He pulled over between the World Trade Center and Two World Financial, where I used to work, then pulled out of his wallet these four Yankee tickets for September 10th. And he wanted me to have these tickets, and we kind of went back and forth, you know, Dad, why don't you go? Why don't we go together? And he said, no, no, that Tuesday morning, which was the 11th, uh, we have a big chief's meeting. And I, you know, I want to get there on time, so I want you to go. Tonight's game here at Yankee Stadium has been postponed. Actually, it's September 10th, the game ended up being rained out anyway. And it was the last time I saw him was when he gave me the Yankee tickets. This just into our newsroom, a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. A major terror attack in the United States and here in New York on the World Trade Tower. The World Trade Center has just collapsed. It's just a chaotic scene down here like nothing I've ever seen before. September 11, 2001 was the worst day in the history of the city. Everyone in the city should remain calm. The very best thing to do right now would be to remain home. I could see from the very beginning with the number of casualties and the tremendous damage that was done. And even the thought that we'd probably be attacked again during that period of time, that this was it's gonna be really, really difficult. Errant plane crashing into the Pentagon, causing a huge fireball. A large plane has crashed in western Pennsylvania. The final death toll from this terrible tragedy will not likely be known for weeks. The world is a very different place from the way we left it about two and a half hours ago. I'd ask the people of New York City to do everything that they can to cooperate, not to be frightened, to go about their lives as normal. Everything is safe right now in the city. And the people who are doing the relief effort need all the help they can get. In the anxious days following September 11th, the nation united behind the strength and heroism of New York's firefighters, police officers, and relief workers. Ordinary citizens thrust into extraordinary circumstances. We need more volunteers here immediately. Shea Stadium served as a staging area for rescue supplies. And the New York Mets baseball team, overlooking its exalted status, banded together with other volunteers. We got a, we got a box of t-shirts here. 
People came in from Wall Street who had walked home, and two days later, you know, I need to do something. I have to help. What can I do? I had that same feeling that, that so many uh, other Americans had of just, to, I needed to do something. The Yankees, too, pitched in. Following the team's first post 9 11 gathering, manager Joe Torrey led a group of players on a goodwill trip downtown. We went to the armory, which was the most emotional, and we didn't really know if we should be there. This is where families were all gathered to wait on word if their loved ones were alive. And if they weren't alive, uh, evidence that they weren't alive. So they were doing DNA samplings. I, I felt, anyway, completely out of place. You know, I'd kind of walked in, you know, what am I doing here? Um, what do I have to offer these people? I, I remember one very poignant moment when Bernie Williams went up to this woman, and he was sort of fumbling, and he, and he says, I, I, don't, I don't know what to say. He says, but you look like you need a hug. And he put his arms around her, and I, and I think sort of broke the ice to see that, you know, these people needed this. And I think at that point in time, I realized that there was a role for us. If any group of New Yorkers needed comfort, it was the city's fire department, which lost 343 firefighters at the World Trade Center. On the morning of September 11th, Brooklyn's Ladder 101, carrying seven men, was called to the Twin Towers. None of the seven made it back. I can't believe it happened. It's, uh... It's, it'll never go away. It's always there the rest of my life. Uh, after 9-11, I was uh, visiting one of the widows, one of the guys I lost, firefighter Joe Mafio. I was at her house, and I got a call that uh, the Yankees are at the firehouse. The guys in the firehouse knew what a big, crazy Yankee fan I was. And one of my guys says, uh, the Yankees are here. I said, no, can't be. The Yankees are in the firehouse? He said, yeah, I got somebody who wants to talk to you. Excuse me, sir, this is Derek Jeter. I said, no, it can't be Derek Jeter. He said, yes, sir, this is Derek Jeter. So he called me, sir, a few times, and I talked to him a few minutes, and I was, I, I couldn't even talk to him. I was like, tongue-tied. They were there to, just to cheer us up a little bit. I really wanted to be there, but I knew I was in the right place by uh, visiting one of the widows. In New York, the sound of bagpipes echoed throughout the city. Each day meant another wake, another funeral, another lost hope. You can mourn and you can be very, very sorrowful. And at the same time, you, you can go on with your life. The only two things that got my mind off it for any period of time in the fall of 2001 were baseball and my son's football games. One thing that I've been really missing, and I'm going to really break down tonight, I'm going to go to a Met game. Here in New York City tonight, the first major sporting event since last week's catastrophe is underway. Major League Baseball at Shea Stadium, where the New York Mets and the Atlanta Braves put on a stirring show of support for New York and America. For 15 minutes or 20 minutes, I could feel that I was in a state of normalcy again. We almost needed to go. I think that when something serious happens in your life, whether it's a death in your family or a traumatic event, our historic event, y you cling to things that are familiar and comfortable to you. A ball game on a Friday night in New York was as ordinary as it gets. But not on this night. It was New York's first mass gathering since the attack 10 days earlier. 9-11 heroes lined the field as 41,000 fans came together in a show of strength and resolve. But still, the evening was met with a measure of unease. It was nerve-wracking because you couldn't be there without thinking about a uh, possibility of an attack. I think the first couple of uh, airplanes that went by, people got nervous and looked at them. 
people did not know how to react at the ball game. There was all this hidden anxiety of let's continue to mourn and let's continue not to show a, any emotion other than mourning. But in the bottom of the eighth, with his team down by a run, Mets catcher Mike Piazza lifted the crowd in a triumphant salute to the city. And it's hit deep to left center. Andrew Jones on the run. This one has a chance. Home run, Mike Piazza. And with that crack of the bat, spontaneously people stopped mourning and stood and cheered. It was an amazing night because everybody's intent changed. It wasn't just a ball game. It wasn't just a song. It became a fight song. It became a call. I want to wake up, boom, in the city that doesn't sleep. To fight, I'm king of the hill, head of the list, cream of the crop at the top of the heap. Boom. People came to Shea Stadium to be together. And that sense of unity in a time of crisis is incredibly empowering. This is what we're all about, not terrorist attacks and horrible things. Let's show people that we can act normally. And maybe it'll help other people start acting that way. We can get through this. The physical act of going to a ball game, it was a sense of moving forward that nothing else had, because everything else was 9-11. 9-11 was, in essence, the longest day of our lives, because it went on for several months. I mean, as long as they were still digging people out of the pit, it was still 9-11. In the aftermath of September 11th, the mood of the country changed. Baseball games became communal gathering places for fans to express their emotions. And as much of the country turned a sympathetic eye to New York. The Red Sox ask you to join us in a tribute to the spirit of the people of New York. The city's baseball teams became the objects of affection. I could not, under any circumstances, ever imagine cheering for the Yankees. But I think America's sense of New York changed in September 11th and, and the days afterwards. The face of New York changed. It was 343 New York firefighters who walked into the fires of hell to save strangers. And it becomes very difficult to hate the Yankees. It was amazing to see the transformation because for the rest of that year anyway, we weren't the hated Yankees. I mean, it was kind of like we were the symbol for these people in New York going through this. With a newfound mission, the Yankees marched to their fourth division title in a row and prepared to face Oakland in the first round of the playoff series. The Yankee playoff series gave me something else to focus on instead of dead bodies, you know, bombing Afghanistan, seeing the footage of the Twin Towers falling over and over again. Ooh, another game, you know, something else to watch. In order to fully defend America, we must defeat the evildoers where they hide. But even in the seemingly safe haven of Yankee Stadium, news of the war on terror and the recent bombings in Afghanistan was inescapable. To me, every day, especially during the playoffs, every day at the stadium was just an emotional roller coaster. Before the game and after the game, we're meeting firefighters' families, you know, kids of pilots killed in the crash. And so you're, you're crying five minutes before a game starts because you just, you just feel that. And the A's are going home up two games to none. The strain on the Yankees showed. They lost the first two games in a best of five series at home and it looked as if their season was over. Then, just as their 1-0 lead was about to vanish in game three, 
they were brought back to life by the defensive genius of shortstop Derek Jeter. Jeter came out of nowhere, literally out of nowhere. And when he flipped the ball, I didn't think that it would get there in time because it really was a bang-bang play. But when they called him out, oh, that saved the series. And a win in game four brought the series to a deciding game five. And the Yankees back to the place they most wanted to be. Being in that stadium and the energy and what was going on, you know, I think was very special. I think you were very lucky to be at Yankee Stadium during, a, during that playoff run. Hammer down the right field line, justice. The crowds cheered, and it was almost the sense as they were cheering just to cheer. Emotions for so long had been negative. It was just such a relief to have something positive. And they're roaring in the Bronx. The Yankees will defend their title. It's a great boost for the city. I mean, it make, makes people the city feel very proud. I mean, they, they identify so much with the Yankees. Yankee Stadium is, is a special place, and we just we, we just feel the heartbeat of the people. Soriano hits it into deep right center field. The Yankees were suddenly invincible. The Yankees win. In the second round of the playoffs, they polished off the Seattle Mariners, the best team in baseball, in five games. It was almost like this city needed something to try to try to get away from it just for a few hours. It gave people something to look forward to the next day, all the way into the World Series. I think the players, they developed a sense of fate. Everything that's gone on, it makes sense that New York would have a championship. You had heart as big as this city, and you showed what being New Yorkers is all about. God bless you. Yeah! Twenty four hundred miles from ground zero, the World Series opened in Phoenix, Arizona. The four year old Diamondbacks had built their team around veterans and made it to the World Series faster than any expansion team in history. There was a bunch of old guys on that team, just a bunch of crotchety old guys that had never been to a World Series, never won squat, myself included. In contrast, this Yankee team was one of the most accomplished in the history of baseball, winning four World Series in the previous five years. I remember they walked in here for game one, and I'm looking over there, I'm trying to find a reason not to like them. You know, because you want to put something in your head, man, you know, I don't like these guys, you know. And I couldn't find anything. These guys walk with a swagger, but it's not arrogance, it's just confidence. I guess most of the media is saying that, you know, they think that the, the, the country's going to be behind the Yankees. Uh, it's a little ironic because most often the people pull or go against the Yankees. We were the bad guys coming in, the ones that, uh, how dare they do that to our brothers and sisters of New York. We had to be very careful with the things that we said and the way we uh, conducted ourselves in interviews because we understood the sensitive nature of, of what had happened. But our job now was to play baseball and to beat your team. Showing remarkable confidence of their own, Arizona's hitters opened the series with an offensive explosion. Race, a fly ball into right center field. Scoring is Finley, scoring is Williams, and the route is on in Arizona. But the backbone of the team was pitching. And Schiller, his eighth strikeout of the night. In the first two games of the series, Arizona's aces, Kurt Schilling and Randy Johnson, drained the life out of New York's lineup. By the time they were through, Arizona was halfway to a world title. And Randy Johnson twirls a complete game three-hit shutout to give the Arizona Diamondbacks a two-games-to-none lead in this World Series.
we all knew that this series is going back to New York. This series is going back to Yankee Stadium. And this series is going back to a place that couldn't wait to embrace baseball because of what the city went through. 48 days after the attack, New York remained on high alert. Armed guards were visible on city streets. Security checkpoints were posted at bridges and tunnels. Soldiers with M16s patrolled train stations. There was a moroseness to the city. Dog faces of doom and gloom everywhere because every moment we're being told, in the subway, you might perish from an anthrax attack. Everywhere you looked, you saw potential terrorists. Paranoia was thick in the air, and naturally, media kept feeding that. Downtown at City Hall, the mayor's office was in crisis mode on a daily basis, including the day before the World Series. We're preparing for the Yankees coming home. On Sunday, we have the marathon, and these are large events. And all of a sudden, out of Washington, the FBI puts us on super duper alert, top secret. I don't even know what they called it at the time. I think it was pre-color. There may be additional terrorist attacks within the United States and against the United States interests over the next week. And we all look at each other and we say, well, what does this mean? If you think it's necessary to cancel the baseball game, we will. If you think we need to cancel the marathon, we will. You want us to close the airports? We will. But we need some direction. So they did. The FBI gave the information so we were able to assess it. And we decided we'd go forward with it. This is 1010 Wins. Good morning. It's 51 degrees at 620 on this Tuesday, October 30th. The FBI is warning Americans and law enforcement to be on the highest alert possible for terror attacks. They're down, but they're not out. The Yankees host the Arizona Diamondbacks tonight in Game 3 of the World Series. The Bombers badly need a win. The last thing that I thought I would feel after September 11th was, was joy. But there were the Yankees. You know, it was an outlet for every ounce of happiness you could muster, you know, every celebration. Since September 11th, Greg Manning's days and nights have been confined to the burn center at New York Presbyterian Hospital, where he kept vigil over his wife, Lauren, a World Trade Center survivor. Lauren was burned on uh, more than 80% of her body. Her chances of surviving were really one in five. I don't think any of the doctors uh, really had any hope for her. Lauren was sedated for a long time, and she really didn't start to wake up until the middle of the World Series. And one of the first things that she had the chance to do when she was awake and aware was to look at me, and uh, one of her nurses said, you know, the World Series is uh, at Yankee Stadium tonight. And I, I looked at her and I said, you know, and I've got tickets. And, and the nurse said, are you going? And I said, it's up to her. And so Lauren looked at me. And, you know, one of the first things she said was to go. She waved at me and she mouthed, go. That was the first time that, in Lauren's case, I was willing to jump up and down and start screaming. Because then, you know, we really knew she had turned the corner. And so I said, okay, honey, I'm going to the game. People are lined up 10, 20, 50 deep. It's a mob scene outside. Much more of a police presence. You go through the magnetometer, hand search. This had another level of intensity to it. I remember seeing guys holding automatic weapons, and I remember thinking to myself, this is now my America. Walking into the locker room and seeing a bomb dog go through your, your locker. These were reminders of what was going on around us. Another reason for the heightened security was the appearance of a guest from Washington. As we walked into the locker room, there was a gentleman standing there that we had never seen before. He says, well, President Bush is going to come, and he's going to throw out the first pitch, and we need a Secret Service agent on the field, and so I am going to dress as an umpire, he had communications, he had guns, he had things hooked on the back, he had things hooked on the front. And I said, how are you gonna hide all that stuff? He says, don't worry, he says, it'll disappear. 
All of a sudden, there was a knock at the door, and President Bush walked into our room. Thank you. Will you do me a favor and say hi to my son because he's one of your biggest supporters? <laughs> Jimmy? Your name, Jimmy. Jimmy, how are you? Well, when you're president, all you have to do is say you're showing up, and they kind of ask you to throw out the first pitch, no matter what time of year it is. This is my first World Series. Is it really? Yeah. I vowed I'd never go to a World Series unless the Rangers got in. <laughs> and I changed that down. <laughs> you know, I want to make sure that if I was going to throw out the ball, I was able to do so with a little zip. You know, I didn't want people to think that their president was incapable of finding the plate. So I go underneath the Yankee Stadium in the bowels of Yankee Stadium, and there's a hitting cage there. And he's wearing his bulletproof jacket, and he's getting his arm loose, and Derek Jeter comes up to him. Hey, Prez, how are you doing? Good, Derek. That's good luck tonight. Thank you, sir. And he said, say, I hear you're throwing out the first ball. So I just asked him if he was going to be throwing the first pitch from the mound or in front of the mound. The president said, I felt, think I'll throw from the base of the mound. Jeter said, I wouldn't do that if I were you, Mr. President. And I told him, uh, you better throw from the mound, otherwise you're going to get booed. I said, this, this is Yankee Stadium. I said, OK, I'll throw from the mound. And he's walking out, and he looks over his shoulder, and he says, don't bounce it. They'll boo you. And so the pressure all of a sudden, I mean, I'm sitting there kind of fairly relaxed and feeling fairly loose, and the great Derek Jeter. Don't bounce it. They'll boo you. And all of a sudden, the pressure mounted. The President of the United States. I'd never felt what I'd felt before when I walked out of that dugout. I felt the raw emotion of the Yankee fans. USA! 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 The crowd just erupts in a chant of USA. There is nothing like it that I've ever experienced at a ball game. It, it was overwhelming. It was just overwhelming. President Bush is standing out there like a brick wall. I'm not afraid of terrorists. I'm going to stand all out here. I'm going to give you a thumbs up, and I'm going to throw a strike. I didn't vote for him, but at that point, my personal feelings about him as a politician is gone. I watched him, and he was my representative. And I had never felt that way before. Very nice throw, Mr. President. Good stuff, good stuff. At that moment, everybody there was there for baseball and to show the world that in spite of what can happen to us, we'll pull ourselves together, and what is our life and our way of life will continue. United, we stand. We stand together in the face of this threat. We will play baseball in the midst of the, the beginnings of this war. No matter what the threat may be to us, the United States of America will stand strong and will never be intimidated. The business at hand was now baseball, and the spotlight turned to Roger Clemens. On, Roger! The Yankees were desperate for a win, and Clemens delivered as he shut down the Diamondbacks and threw the crowd into a frenzy. The place was alive. You could look in the stands and, and people just needed this and they wanted this and they were just thrilled to be there and to be a part of it. Posada, deep left field, one to nothing. We knew so many colleagues who had died. You really were kind of afraid to crack a smile. But, you know, when you go to Yankee Stadium, you could stand up and scream, jump up and down. It was just this wonderful release. In the end, the Yankees entrusted a 2-1 lead to Mariano Rivera, the best closer in postseason history. Cutting the series deficit to two games to one, the Yankees were back in it. While much of New York rejoiced, a somber mood prevailed nine miles to the south, where workers at Ground Zero were in their 50th straight day of round-the-clock cleanup. It turned into a recovery operation by that time, and we were no longer really trying to find anyone alive. And we're going to dig. And we're going to do what we can. It was really sad timing. 
you know, the whole impact of what was going on had sunk in. Crane would come, pull stuff up, and you'd be looking for God knows why. You know what you're looking for, but, you know, that's what you do when you're sifting through. It's constantly sifting through whatever was down there. It comes time for a break. So we come down with 10 Sims and starts walking back, and he's hungry. You know, I'm hungry. I said, okay. And I said, don't eat anything. What do you mean? I got to eat something. I said, I'm taking care of it. Don't eat anything. I talked to a friend of mine who works on Wall Street. He says, we're going to get you dinner. Wayne had two big bundles. I don't know where he got them from. I don't know how he got them there. He sent me Morton steaks, asparagus vinaigrette, cheesecake with whipped cream, curly fry. Oh, it was just unbelievable. We worked hard, you know, it was like a depressing kind of atmosphere, but we're going to make the best of this bad situation. I remember telling him, you know, the Yankees are playing tonight. The game has probably started already. We found a recliner and a 27-inch TV. Welcome back to Yankee Stadium and welcome to the movie. We hooked it up and there it was. This guy was happy for a, sh a brief period of time and enjoy something. And we felt really good about that. It was wonderful. Me and this TV set had four or five acres of, of rubble. Uh, but I had a full belly, Yankees in the World Series, steak. I was an American. Throughout the World Series, a tattered flag found among the ruins at Ground Zero flew from the top of Yankee Stadium, a stark reminder. Prior to 9-11, seventh inning stretch is usually reserved for peanuts and Cracker Jack, and, you know, it's all for fun, but people are not taking American flags with them to the ballpark. There was a seriousness post 9-11 that you never felt in the stadium before. When I heard God Bless America, it was very hard to hold back tears. I looked at my mom, she had tears in her eyes. I think, you know, half the people around me were, were crying. It was, it was very powerful. The flag meant something different. It meant something more, at least to me. My dad died in this tragedy, and that's why people are putting flags up, because 3,000 people tragically died. But there were those for whom any reminder was still too much to bear. I always excused myself, you know, and just walked away whenever they sang God Bless America. It was because I just, I really couldn't deal with it. And it was because my brother died. Sean Powell's brother, Scott, was a civilian working with the uniforms at the Pentagon. In his department, he was really the only person who didn't escape. And I had a really tough time dealing with that. It was almost like I didn't want to know that. We all grieve differently, but I think that the most therapeutic thing for me was to get back to work as soon as possible. I, I had to cover that World Series. Obviously, I knew that I would have the constant reminders. I didn't want to give myself an opportunity to have some sort of breakdown, so I always left. It was sort of like clockwork. And I always thought the bathroom was like the safest place. It was a great spot for me just to go and just kind of wait it out. But even in the bathroom, you couldn't escape the sound of the applause. And it was always my signal that, you know, the coast was clear. I could kind of come back and, and resume work. And here's Kurt Schilling. His numbers this postseason are fantastic. The Yankee fans, they are angry, loud, obnoxious, rude, vulgar, uh, incredibly passionate people. If they boo you as a visiting player, that just means you don't suck. Oblivious to the taunts, Kurt Schilling was nearly untouchable in game four. Schilling just pounded it by him. And a fly ball straight away center field hit well. Williams on the run. He's not going to get. In the top of the eighth, Yankee fans watched in sobering silence as the Diamondbacks went on the offensive. To short, Jeter, what a play, and safe as Posada dropped it. It's 3-1 to one Arizona. With his team ahead by two runs in the bottom of the eighth, Arizona manager Bob Brenly pulled Schilling in favor of his closer. That's enough. That's enough. No, no, I'm huh? right. 
Listen, you're at 88 right now. We got BK locked and loaded for the last six outs, man. Let's, let's, you know, you're a hero already, man. All right, to go another one. I mean, fuck. let's save him. Let's save him. Let's save him. Pitching your ass off. That's good, man. That's good. I knew physically I was near the end of my tank that night, but I still felt that I was better than anybody he was going to bring in. Well, BK Kim is a guy without a whole lot of experience. He's from Korea, doesn't speak a lot of English. Not even his teammates really know him that well. Stuff-wise, it's electric. Struck him out, and the inning is over. Kim fans aside in his World Series debut. In that eighth inning, there was nobody questioning whether Kim should have been in the game or not. I mean, we were down uh, two runs, uh, and you know, your your, pro your thought process as a player is just uh, hit, run, walk, hit by pitch, anything. O'Neill breaks his bat, floats one to left, it's a base hit, and the tying run will come to the plate here in the ninth inning. So now it's Tino Martinez, and the Diamondbacks are one out away, taking a three games to one lead. For some reason, I just didn't like seeing Tino come to the plate. It's like, this is a dangerous guy. Well, the whole freaking team is dangerous. It was pretty dire at that point. I was sitting there, I had a sweater coat on, and I pulled it up to my eyes, because I didn't want to see. And then I started screaming. Nonsense, just screaming. It was unbelievable. was so pumped, I have never felt the upper deck go up and down like an accordion. Everyone in the stadium was jumping up and down at that point. That's the best game I've ever been to, still. <laughs> Even after New York's comeback, Bob Brenly stayed with Kim, and in the 10th, sent him out for his third inning of work. The game did start on Halloween night with a full moon. We know we already had Mr. October well-established in Reggie Jackson. And Derek Jeter comes to the plate, and the clock strikes 12. And we now have batting for the New York Yankees, Mr. November. Swung on a drill to right field, going back to and the track at the wall. See ya! See ya! See ya! Oh, what a ball game! A game-winning walk-off home run by Derek Jeter! And this series is now tied at two. This fits perfectly with the scene. We see New Yorkers battling, whether they're in pinstripes, in a police uniform, down to ground zero, or just average Joes walking the street. Everyone shared the same spirit. You, you think about the raw emotions that everybody took into the ballpark that night, and you begin to think, you know what, something bigger is going on here. And we just have to sit back and watch it play out. Dear Derek Jeter, as you have heard, there was a horrible accident that involved the Twin Towers. There was a hijacking on a plane. Terrible people are in this world, but you and I both know that. Well, Derek Jeter was always my favorite player, so I decided to write a letter to him. I wasn't feeling very well during that time. I, I was kind of sad, very sad, actually. And I thought it would be a good way to get my spirit level up a little, you know? Out of respect, I would love it if you would pay me a visit because that horrible hijacking happened to be my father. My husband, Victor, was the captain of United Flight 175 that struck the South Tower. When Brielle found out about her dad, uh, she, you know, of course, there were a flood of emotions going on, and she just needed something to make her feel good. My dad was a great father to me, and he would want me to conquer my dream meeting you. Love, Brielle. I was just sitting on my couch one day, and Derek called. I, he was like, do you know who this is? I was like, no, I thought it was like someone just playing a joke on me, you know? And he was like, it's Derek Jeter. Nah, -uh. <laughs> and it, it just, it actually was him. So he invited me up to the stadium, invited me to meet him, and I was just like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> After the telephone call with Derek Jeter, Brielle ran up to her room, and I heard her sing. 
And that was the first time that she started singing since September 11th. And gosh, the, the feeling that I got just to know that something was making her happy, something was giving her pleasure, something was making her forget. I got up to the stadium and it was just amazing and nobody was there. So um, it was like I had a whole stadium to myself and the Yankees, how cool is that? Derek Jeter came over and I just looked at him and I could not say anything. I was stunned, it was awesome. What is that? Oh, my God. Some people say things like uh, baseball. Could that be so important to somebody and making them feel good? Uh, each person's different. You never really know what it is that's going to click. I mean, baseball baseball just made 9-11 a little better for, for us. Yankee Stadium, Game 5, the swing game in the World Series between the three-time defending champion New York Yankees and the Arizona Diamondbacks. Yankees all the way. They're tied at two games apiece. Oh, last night was unforgettable, and we're just well on our way to another World Series victory. Everybody was ready for bed. They are ready to call it a night, turn off the TV, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> we're all jumped up and, you know, raring to go again. I want the Yankees to win, but I want the Yankees to win more so for New York City this year. As long as the Yankees continued to pull off miracles, nobody was complaining about the late hours they were keeping. To a city steeped in despair, the Yankees had become a beacon of hope. I was close to bottom at that point, and uh, getting to Yankee Stadium was uh, enlightening. It, was, it lifted me. I felt that there was other people around me that was in the same predicament, and that uh, they were rallying to uh, get out of the muck, and, uh, and I chose that point to uh, get out of the muck myself. You had a game that you went as a child with your brothers, and we played baseball our whole lives, and, um, and uh, now you're at a game by yourself. Kieran Lynch's older brothers, Sean and Farrell, worked on the 104th floor of the World Trade Center's North Tower. On the morning of September 11th, a frantic Kieran called Farrell from his Connecticut office. I said to him, get Sean. And he said that he was heading over there now and that he would uh, contact me um, as, his, as he made his way down. Kieran waited by a phone that never rang. I called my father not too long after that, and he picked up in his cheery Irish accent, and uh, I had to tell him um, what happened. You know, I was, I was witnessing on TV, and uh, he asked me what I should do. You know, there's a grown man asking me what I should do, and uh, I say, better get a priest. In the months following 9-11, Kieran struggled to carry on without his brothers. His first visit back to New York would not be a trip to Ground Zero, but to Yankee Stadium for Game 5 of the World Series. Now, stepping into Yankee Stadium for the first time was a connection to my brothers. I felt I had to be at the game, and it was almost like a, to a certain destiny, to a certain degree, that I was at the game. I was resolved to the fact that I'm moving on, and I'm going to get better, and I'm going to do everything I can to make sure I can keep Sean and Farrell's memories alive. By the fifth inning of game five, the series was following a familiar pattern. The Yankees weren't hitting. And Arizona was. In a high fly ball, deep right field, and that ball long gone, and the Diamondbacks have drawn first blood. One two pitch, and Barajas hits it into deep left field. Back at the wall, it's 2 0 Arizona. Once again, the Yankees were down to their final three outs and in danger of falling behind in the series. Then, 
Bob Brenly again gave rise to second guessing. New pitcher Kim, new left fielder Danny Batista. Kim is in the game. People were literally screaming, what is he doing? This guy had his heart ripped out on the mound, but when he brought him out, it, it was just like, you're asking for another disaster. Now it's up to Brocious for New York. Under its second, two out, two nothing Arizona, here in game five. You can't expect to come back time and time again, not two or three nights in a row, especially in the World Series, off the same guy. Ball one. I have several rituals for luck at key moments. I felt that if there was ever a time when I needed to do this with my cap, this was the moment. Yankees trying to work their magic one more time. And then the pitch. Holy shit, holy shit. I'm not believing what I'm seeing now. It just happened again, two nights in a row. Once again, deja vu. Probably the most unbelievable feat in World Series history. You have got to be kidding me. The next thing I remember, people grabbing the cap, rubbing the cap, hugging each other. It was hysteria. I was standing by myself, so I was like grabbing guys on the other side of me, and I didn't even know these guys were high five and hugging each other. I've never been part of anything like that in my life. Never in the history of the World Series had a team won a game after a two out bottom of the ninth game tying home run. Now, the Yankees had a chance to do it for the second night in a row. The score was still tied in the bottom of the 12th when New York got a runner to second, and Alfonso Soriano came to the plate. Into right field facing. Here comes Noblock. The throw by Sanders. Play at the plate. Yankees win. They lead the series three games to two. The Yankees had played five games in this series, and they'd been utterly dominated, and yet here they are, one victory away from winning the World Series, and by then you're convinced that they can do anything. It was really miraculous. You knew you were part of great history. Those are the games where Yankee fans want to stay, and they want to soak it in. Those two games were absolutely like miracles. I mean, they, ju they just lifted the spirits of New York. And the Yankees, whether they could accept this or not through humility or whatever, really had their city on their shoulders. I think it was great going to the ballpark. I, I really do. You know, it, it, it helped out a whole lot. It was almost like therapy. But as I got closer to home, walking downtown where Ground Zero is, um, it was a very eerie feeling. It's almost like I never went to the game. Looking and seeing the World Trade still burning and you could still smell the smoke. Seeing the cops and everything like that, you know, it was devastating. I remember always going home and trying to get the sports center to try to recapture the game I just left you know, to keep that energy level up. Good morning, 65 degrees at 620 on this November 3rd. The mayor and some firefighters are at odds over who should be in charge at Ground Zero. The FBI raids an apartment in Trenton in connection with the anthrax case. Marathon Sunday looks good with sunshine, some clouds, and a high of 58. The Yankees go for their fourth straight ring tonight in Arizona. It'll be petted against Johnson. For game six and seven in Arizona, we discussed whether or not the mayor would go, and the one concern was that if something happened in the city, it wasn't that he was an hour out, two hours out, he would be probably five, six, maybe even seven hours out. And the decision was made, we're going. We decided that we were going to take a group of people, including some of the family members that wanted to come to Arizona to see the sixth game, which we fully expected to win. My dad's watching and that's why we know the Yankees will win.
because my dad always wanted yes. the Yankees to win. You know, Mayor Giuliani let us talk. You know, he certainly knew that it was important for us to get our feelings out there. Then we went to the ballpark, and the Yankees got cream that night. It was brutal. Up the middle, and the Diamondbacks take a game six lead. Two more runs, and it's 3-0 Arizona. From the start, the Diamondbacks had Andy Pettit's number. This is a drubbing right now. <laughs> this is just getting ridiculous. To the right side of base hit. <laughs> Two more runs come home. The ugliness continues for the Yankees. It's 14 to nothing. Facing Randy Johnson, the Yankees were just as helpless at the plate. And if things weren't bad enough for New York, alarming news came from the home front. I think we lost like 15 to 2 or something, right? And my cell phone rings, and it's the health commissioner. And he says to me, find a landline if you can and call me at home. So I go inside and I call him. And he says, the tape that was on your desk tested positive for anthrax. And whenever you say the words landline to me, I know this is not to give me good news. I said, I got to go back. Any questions, got to go back. We've got we to get a plane right now and head back. Tonight, investigators are examining traces of anthrax found in a package sent from NBC to City Hall. Anthrax had taken the lives of four victims. And the news that it had spread through the mail gave rise to more fear. We have a confirmed uh, identification of anthrax in an item that was sent to the mayor's office. It goes back some time. Nobody has shown symptoms. This should all uh, probably work itself out pretty easily. In addition to getting in around 6 in the morning, going directly to City Hall, and then starting the marathon, and then riding in the front of the marathon throughout the city, and we got back on a plane about 12, 1 o'clock again and got there just in time for game seven. From Bank One Ballpark in downtown Phoenix, it's game seven of the 2001 World Series of Baseball. And there were 60,000 people in Bank One Ballpark, and every one of them had a white pom-pom. They're playing music and the pom-poms are going, but I can feel the stadium move. And I had, you know, the hair on my neck standing up, and I'm, I'm terrified, but I mean, oh my God, how fun is this? I was nervous to cat, and I said, guys, there's nothing I can tell you. I mean, here we are. We, you know, we win the game, and that's all we need to do. I always say good luck. Uh, if nothing more than two or three words, don't be afraid to make a mistake, whatever it is, just to let them know that I'm with them. Few events in sports can compare to the seventh game of a World Series. This one would be the culmination of a series that in its own humble way had served a grander purpose, and no one wanted to see it end. On this night, fans of a wounded nation would have one last chance to lose themselves in a baseball game. You can watch the Yankees take on the Diamondbacks right here at Rockefeller Plaza. Look at this, we are in the spirit. Those are Yankee flags surrounding the ring. New Yorkers gathered in public places around the city, hoping that the perseverance and heart shown by the Yankees throughout the series would end with one more glorious night. In Arizona, the Yankees and the Diamondbacks placed their destinies in the hands of their aces. Usually you get in these situations with such a buildup and such anticipation, it can't help but let you down. How can you possibly live up to it? Yeah, here's Clemens and Schilling doing exactly that. These guys were on top of their game. And whoever blinked first was probably going to pay the price of losing the world championship. Into left center field. That ball is going to put Arizona on top. Danny Batista delivers again. Going for third. Out, but it's 1-0 Arizona. Clemens faltered briefly. But in the seventh, the Yankees fought back. Martinez with a base hit to right, and the Yankees have tied it. And with the Yankees batting in the eighth, Joe Torre faced a dilemma. Don Zimmer said to me, who's the pitcher? And I said, Mendoza. He says, why not Rivera? I said, I can't bring Rivera in. It's a tie game. I got to wait till we get a lead. 
I said, uh, just have, you know, Soriano hit a home run. He'll solve the whole problem. Into the air to deep left. It is high. It is far. It is gone. And I said, that solves that problem. Alfonso Soriano has given the Yankees a 2-1 lead. You have no more decisions to make. Rivera will be up in the Yankee bullpen. And the Yankees are six outs away from winning their fourth straight world championship. And Schilling will leave on the short end of a two to one game. I give up the home run I thought cost us the World Series. Because they got Mariano Rivera in, in the bullpen. So the game's over. So many teams have tried. So many teams have failed against Mariano Rivera. Since 1998, Rivera had come through in all 23 postseason save opportunities. And the 0-2 pitch is on the way, and Bautista strikes out, and Rivera fans the side in the eighth. And we figured, lock, stock, and barrel, it's another World Series victory. I was like, this is the year. This is, this is the year they have to win. It's destiny. Bottom of the ninth inning. Last chance for the Diamondbacks, down 2-1. to one. I'm sitting like this, just, oh, please, God, please. Mark Grace gets up to start the inning and bloops it into center field. I'm sitting out in the right field seats, and I look up at the clock, and the digits on the clock say 9-11. That gets you thinking. And he bunts back to the mound. There's a play at second. Mariano Rivera is the closer of all closers. He's the mother of all closers. It's almost like you don't believe you see what's actually happening in front of your face. And a line drive, beat hit! Down the right field line, the game is tied! Something has to happen in the bottom of the night for this series. It's been unbelievable. My first thought was, oh my God, we're going to win the World Series. You know, you're talking about just as low as you can be to back to the top in a matter of seconds. And it hit him. The bases are loaded. When that happened, at that point, I kind of knew. I was like, oh, no. Oh, no, this can't be happening. The chance of a lifetime for Luis Gonzalez. 2-2, Two -two, bottom of the ninth. Game seven of the World Series. Bases loaded. Infield in. One out. My ulcer was having a baby. I mean, I'm going crazy. I'm mean, going, come on, God, please get ahead. Florida, center field. The Diamondbacks are world champions. I'm running straight to Gonzo and uh, Bedlam. I mean, it's just, we just beat the Yankees. We won the World Series. We were this close to just having something really cool, you know, not just for us and not just winning, but for the city. You know, life is not fair. I mean, if it was, if there was ever a fair time for the Yankees to win the World Series, that was the year. After that, I didn't wear any purple or any green for months. At Bank One Ballpark, New York's 9-11 family members absorbed their sadness. The Yankees' magical ride was over. Seeing all the kids that we were with and that just lost their dads and, and the 3,000 lives that were lost, we certainly had a, a perspective. And it was disappointing, but you know, we had gotten so much already out of the games. Playing the plane, Yankees win. It was a compelling story. It was a great story. They had to win those three games in Yankee Stadium for it to be right. Throughout the fall of 2001, New York had become a symbol of strength to the rest of the nation. Healing had taken many forms and come from many sources. Those who were caught up in the high drama of the World Series had found their healing in the simple pleasure of watching a baseball game. Waking up every day, September 11th on, was unimaginable. Loved ones were missing. It was the worst thing you could imagine, really. Anything positive that can come out of such a terrible thing 
is something you see yourself gravitating towards. And I think that's what this World Series was. Oh my, what a moment in Yankee Stadium. The purpose of the Yankees and baseball in general is entertainment. And it was a great escape for us. You know, it's not about winning or losing. It's about what baseball brought to the city. It brought me a way to get back and be close to my dad. It's amazing to think that what happened down in Lower Manhattan, that we can move on from there. Baseball does get played. Life goes on. And uh, that World Series was part of the healing process. There was something about baseball, which is the American sport, and it's outdoors, and it's in the fall, and it was right in the city that had been brutally attacked. It had a wonderful impact on the morale of the people of the city. It was exactly what they needed to get their eyes up off the ground looking into the future.